Our next speaker is Dr. Brent Tant. He is a clinical associate professor of um, pathology in the department at Stanford University. He completed his medical school and PhD training at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Uh, he also pursued a residency in anatomic pathology at Stanford, followed by a fellowship in hematopathology at the same institution. He is board certified in hematopathology and clinical informatics with interest in myeloneoplasms, peripheral T-cell lymphomas, and digital pathology. And his current research focuses on molecular markers of disease morphology, uh, of clinical features and prognosis in myelodysplastic syndromes. And today he's going to talk to us about uh, the history and evolution of flow cytometry. So Dr. Brentan, thank you so much for being here. So first I'd like to thank Sergio and the um, uh, Society for uh, uh, the History of Pathology. And I'm going to go through what I think, oh, um, so a little bit of bookkeeping on CME, and I have no disclosures. Okay, so this story uh, about flow cytometry actually starts out with Wallace Coulter. Uh, he was an American engineer. Uh, he has 85 patents uh, under his name, but he discovered that um, when you suspend particles in a solution of electrolytes, and you make them pass through an aperture um, that has an applied electrical current across it, then you get a change in the impedance, which is related to the resistance. Um, and he patented uh, this um, concept in 1953. Um, and it's this is really, really interesting. You see the, the kind of device here where there's a using pressure to pass things through uh, the orifice. And uh, down here, uh, this is another example. Uh, when you look at the orifice kind of on higher power here, what you see here from this uh, patent submission is that in the absence of a particle, there's a certain impedance. But when you have a small or large uh, particle, the uh, change in impedance is actually proportional to the size of the particle. And so this is really interesting. Um, not only is it used as we know it, uh, it was kind of the basis for the modern CBC, which is one of the most important tests we use in the laboratory, but it's also used in other industries such as paint, ceramics, glass, and materials. Waltz, Wallace Coulter actually went on to found the Coulter Corporation in 1958. Uh, that was later acquired uh, by Beckman in 1977. And here's uh, an example of one of the first uh, Coulter, the first commercial counters, the Coulter Counter Model S. And it was uh, evaluated in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology in 1969. So the story continues. Uh, Louis Kamensky uh, was working at IBM. And uh, he was uh, extremely interested in the analysis of cells. Um, much of this was done through, uh, he previously had looked at cancer cells in pap smears and used UV microscopy to, to um, characterize them. But what he had done was created a system whereby you used a pump uh, to pump cells through this, you see here a flow cell. And by using a lamp, um, you could use two different uh, 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 spectral um, uh, emissions. One at 254, and that, as you know, uh, is absorbed by DNA. And then he also simultaneously looked at scattering at 410 uh, nanometers. And this is really amazing. So uh, just looking at the absorption versus the side scatter, you can get a very good idea of what cells look like. And in A and B, these are examples of an epidermoid carcinoma. Uh, and C here, you see normal colonic epithelium. Um, and then here is uh, normal epidermoid epithelium. And really interesting, uh, this is an example of 
an epidermoid carcinoma um, obtained by vaginal wash. Um, and you can see that the high side scatter um, is indicative. I'm sorry, the high absorption at 254 uh, would give you kind of an indication that you had more DNA. Now, he then went on uh, to expand on this concept uh, to create essentially one of the first cell sorters, okay? And you see here, this is the, uh, the fluid and the immersed cells would pass from using air pressure past this um, uh, fluid cell uh, into the output. And then in the fluid cell, you had your optics and you are able to uh, observe the uh, cells. But once you had a cell of interest, he um, has this apparatus here at an orthogonal angle to actuate and you could actually isolate the cells of interest. And here's an example of an isolated um, carcinoma of the uterine cervix cell. So really, really amazing work here. Uh, done in the 1960s. Now, Louis Kamensky uh, then uh, went on um, to, he's uh, also credited for the first flow, flow cytometer with an inbuilt laser called the cytograph in 1970. And then um, that was preceded, uh, proceeded by the cytofluorograph, which is actually used in some very interesting experiments important to science uh, later. Okay, Wolfgang Goad uh, from the University of Munster was very interested in, um, he actually, ethidium bromide is an excellent intercalator into DNA. And um, so he used this, uh, this principle uh, and uh, he was credited for developing the first fluorescence commercial cytometer and it was called the Partec ICP-11. Um, He's really interesting, and, and he later became a, a strong proponent after the discovery of HIV to providing uh, low-cost CD4 counts in Africa and reducing uh, the cost of testing. Okay, the story continues. Uh, Max Fulweiler at Los Alamos Labs was a scientist and uh, he actually, his initial focus, he was not a biologist, but he was um, part of a group who was interested in detecting fallout from nuclear weapons. But after the ban on nuclear testing, um, he needed something to do. And so he would uh, interact with the biologists there. And actually, the reason he, one of the reasons he invented this uh, um, instrumentation which is basically a flow sorter, is because he was in an argument with some of the biologists about uh, some of the different cell sizes that you could see in blood, and he wanted to be able to isolate the big ones from the small ones. So he combined two of the contemporary concepts at the time. Uh, one was from the Coulter counter, which would give you a change in electrical impedance when you had a large cell. And the other concept that he incorporated was uh, the inkjet oscillograph by Richard Sweet from Stanford. So you're gonna hear a decent amount of a plug from Stanford from me. So the way this works is you can imagine that there is a, and I'll go to the next slide, it's probably easier. And this is some amazing original uh, uh, correspondence from Dr. Sweet back to Max. Um, but when you uh, use an acoustic driver um, off of, uh, onto a piece of metal and you have droplets coming off of it, at a certain frequency, you can have uh, the droplets uh, come out very fine. Um, then the idea is with the droplets, if you can apply a charge to each droplet and have the droplet fall through an electrical field and actuate uh, that electrical field based on the results from your Coulter counter, you can then deflect uh, your cells, uh, whether they're, they were um, charged positively or negatively, uh, using that electrical field. 
So essentially the first cell sorter. And here's uh, an image of, of uh, the full wire um, apparatus. Okay, then the story continues with Leonard Herzenberg. Uh, now, Leonard Herzenberg was actually a, both a geneticist and immunologist, and he realized that it was going to be very important to sort cells, and not just a small number of them, and to be able to sort them so that you could recover them and do experiments with live cells. So he looked at the Kamensky, um, the Lou Kamensky pro prototype, and IBM actually had given gifted Stanford with one of these, um, and he he actually used some of the mechanisms uh, from this cell sorter, and he was also influenced by Fullweiler's instrument from Los Alamos, but that, as you recall, only separated cells based on size because it used a Coulter counter. So in a series uh, throughout the years, Leonard Herzenberg, and this is a picture of him and his wife, uh, they pioneered the use of monoclonal antibodies as fax reagents and the use of fluorescence in cell sorting. So you can see here one of the uh, very early experiments done by Hewlett, Bonner, and Herzenberg, where they're able to uh, separate um, uh, tumor cells from smaller mouse spleen cells, uh, and the stained the cells are stained full with fluorescein diacetate. And if you look at the um, the undeflected versus de the deflected fractions, you can see how they enrich uh, in the plaque forming units uh, based on the cell sorting experiments. And this is a uh, this is a review article from Dr. Herzenberg, um, just showing how the apparatus uh, works. And it's, it's largely the same these days, although there's a lot of advances in fluidics and detectors, the same principles occur by which you use the um, Richard Sweet principle of um, driving a nozzle with uh, ult essentially ultrasound um, and then charging the um, uh, the particles according to what kind of characteristics the cells have, and then sorting them um, into um, a deflected, uh, say left or right deflected, or even a 96 well plate. So I should mention that um, in order to accomplish this, one has to couple the fluorescence chemicals to the antibodies. And, and this is credited to, uh, to Kuhn's and colleagues. And this is just an experiment uh, showing that uh, the yield um, and then the amount of fluorescein that they're able to, um, to add uh, to different preparations of antibodies. And so later in uh, Len, Len Hertzenberg's uh, laboratory, it was... Um, uh, Dr. Loken, uh, this is a, just an amazing experiment. Uh, we all know that IgM and IgD, the first, uh, the first antibody subtypes that you get on your B cells, this is a two-color fluorescence uh, experiment, um, really basically uh, defining the development of not the naive B cells uh, in spleen. And here's a, here's a very nice image of Dr. Herzenberg in his laboratory. And um, I, I didn't know this, but actually the principle by which we clone hybridomas, okay, so hybridomas are made by um, essentially fusing um, uh, single B cells uh, with a myeloma cell line so that they can be immortalized and continue to grow infinite amounts of protein. Um, well, we actually, uh, the most efficient way to actually clone out that individual cell is to use a cell sorter. And so this is an experiment by David Parks showing that um, uh, using these myeloma-coupled microspheres that are then uh, tagged, with fluorescent, um, tagged with fluorescence, you can see here that uh, the... Uh, IgG1 hybrid cells uh, or uh, the supernatant from those cells will give you um, a really high yield of, of anti-IgG1A, but not IgG1B. 
And you can use this principle to then clone out your single cells that are very sp highly specific. And this is extremely important uh, because if you look at um, the original uh, uh, Kohler and Milstein, the experiments used to actually isolate your hybridomas, it's a very time consuming process. What you need to do is you need to plate out your colonies in soft agar. Uh, and basically uh, a lot of these are based on either colorimetric or uh, red cell lysis. And then you suck out your, or pipette out your colonies with um, the most activity. And this is a very time consuming process. Okay, so this, uh, this story gets uh, uh, very important for not just only pathology, but all of medicine. Um, and with, uh, because of the ability to, to select out uh, individual uh, antibodies, it then became uh, very important. And it was, we were able to uh, create, say, T-cell antigen-specific antibodies. This was done by basically injecting mice with purified human peripheral T cells. And those were uh, uh, isolated by their ability to, uh, to make rosettes around the T cells. And then the spleens of the mice were harvested and made into hybridomas. And those hybridomas cells were cloned. And then that cytofluorograph I showed previously uh, were used to stain, uh, to isolate, uh, um, sorry, were used to assay the supernatant of some of these clones. And these clones uh, in this experiment showed that, uh, so the OKT1, OKT3, and OKT4, you have, may have seen these in the literature. Uh, those are antibodies against CD5, CD3, and CD4. Uh, and they're uh, reactive against human uh, peripheral T, but not B cells. And so this was very important uh, in the during the AIDS epidemic, uh, where people realized that um, uh, there was a loss of the T cells that were reactive against LU3, which is CD4. And then uh, furthermore, it was then discovered that antibodies against CD4 are what would block uh, the ability for HIV uh, to be um, uh, to be uh, uh, propagated in culture. So very important. Uh, and then finally, um, this is a study by Janice Georgi at UCLA showing the um, absolute CD4 cell count declining precipitously uh, in people infected with HIV and then the AIDS syndrome defined essentially by uh, CD4 counts. So um, then at Stanford, uh, using all of these antibodies and cell sorting, uh, Irv Weissman and, and colleagues, uh, as well as, uh, as John Dick and, and colleagues at, uh, from the University of Toronto, um, isolated the human stem, uh, the uh, long-term hematopoietic stem cell and subsequently human stem cells, as well as uh, their multipotent progenitors and kind of, uh, giving us a roadmap for how we think about hematopoiesis. And so this, this principle actually is important for the way we think of the bone marrow transplant. Um, so where is flow cytometry going in the future? This is the typical flow cytometer. Uh, and we now used uh, various filters to detect uh, the uh, different antibodies at different wavelengths. The future actually is that you not only have maybe say four different filters and, and, uh, and um, uh, sensors, but in what's called spectral flow cytometry, you have 42 different sensors and you don't use any filters and you deconvolute the spectral, um, the complexity uh, mathematically. And so this way you can have many, many different colors um, and not worry about the compensation. Uh, this is going to be uh, very challenging, but probably in our future. Um, and then Sean Bendel at Stanford uh, then went on to, this is, this is a new um, idea, but it's actually called single cell or CYTOF, single cell mass spectroscopy, where instead of using a fluorescence tag, you tag with um, uh, 
uh, heavy metal ions. And essentially, you nebulize them and you run mass spec. So in this, in this type of experiment, you can use an infinite number, almost infinite number of colors because you have all these different weighted uh, uh, ions for use in mass spec, and you don't have to worry about compensation. And uh, he used this uh, to uh, really, really in great detail uh, perform some uh, really high resolution mapping of human hemato of uh, sorry mouse hematopoiesis. And so I'll end on this and and give us some time uh, towards the end. So thank you very much.